This is the story of Paul Dyson, who strangled his girlfriend on February the 13th, 2005. This is the tale of a man more useless than the G in lasagna. I'm going to go through the facts of this case, which took place in England. And the theme of today's video is that a man's lack of confidence drove him to kill his partner. I'll tell you the story and then I'll give you my own personal opinion so we can engage in a dialogue on why you think he acted the way he did. So if you do end up liking this video, please subscribe. And if you would like to join my fantastic community, Discord links are in the description. Now, Paul was known as a big man with a big mouth and a history of sadistic violence towards women. Some people call that a cad, you know, someone that's dishonorable towards women. He pled guilty to the murder of his girlfriend at their Hull home. He drove 100 miles to dump her body in North Yorkshire. Then he made a tear-filled TV appearance begging people to help him find his girlfriend. Choking back sobs and wringing a handkerchief in his fingers, Paul Dyson looked into the TV camera and spoke of the deep mono love he shared with his missing fiance, Joanne Nelson. He told how on Valentine's Day, they shared a hug, they gave each other cards, they gave each other gifts. He had gone to work and returned home to find her gone. He told reporters that he loved her to bits and could never hurt her. He looked the ultimate broken man. However, whilst watching this performance, police officer Ray Higgins, his attention was drawn to Dyson's hands. He spotted two crescent-shaped cuts on Dyson's thumbs. The tiny marks were textbook throttling injuries, self-inflicted during the act of strangulation. And as Dyson stumbled over his words and poured his heart out to reporters, Joanne Nelson's body was lying in woodland in North Yorkshire, covered with branches and hidden from view. Dyson had killed her days earlier, following a row over him not helping her around the house. And this is where the lack of confidence comes in. I think Joanne made Paul feel like he was a nobody. She put him down. I'm not saying she did. I'm saying that's how Paul took it and then he acted. But we'll get to that later. The TV performance was part of an elaborate cover-up hatched only minutes after he strangled Joanne on the floor of the home they shared. It spoke volumes about the cruel, violent and deceptive man who was Paul Dyson. Paul was born in August 1974 to parents Christine and Peter Dyson, with one younger sister and a half-brother. There was little in his childhood that mocked him out as a future killer. Interestingly, Dyson was close to his father, and his father, in 1967, was convicted of manslaughter. Talk about apples and trees, eh? His father spent six years in prison, and Peter, who was 22 at the time, stabbed John Dickinson, who was also 22, with a kitchen knife during a fight over Mr. Dickinson's friendship with Mrs. Dyson. The fight took place at night in a narrow passageway in Barnsley, which is in the north of England. In a separate incident, his father was involved in a road accident that left a 47-year-old dead. Gordon Kell was on his way home after celebrating his silver wedding anniversary with his wife and family when he was in an accident with a van being driven by Peter Dyson. Now, Peter himself was devastated by his father's death in June 2000. Peter Dyson had worked as a doorman in Hull city centre pubs and this played a part in influencing Paul's later choice of career. See, Paul was educated at Sydney Smith Comprehensive School. He then went to Hull College, where he obtained a diploma in civil engineering, which is impressive. And later, the Bishop Burton Agricultural College, where he obtained a national diploma in horticulture. At 17, he spent several months in Saudi Arabia with his father, working in general maintenance. He also worked as a gardener for some time and as a machinist in Hull. On December the 2nd, 2004, he started working for Byram Timber in Summerdon Road as a cross-cut operative where he was working at the time of his arrest. But Dyson, despite being known as a hard worker, his passion was kickboxing. And at the age of 15, his father introduced him to martial arts. Dyson trained to brown belt standard and in 1995, Dyson was a reserve for the British team in the World Kickboxing Championships. He later became equally keen on bodybuilding. He began to use anabolic steroids, injecting them straight into his system. And just so you know, most people that take steroids, do you know where they inject them? You don't know? Yes, up their bum. 
Dyson had a circle of acquaintances and a handful of close friends. His bond with his trainer was demonstrated when Dyson chose to confide in him about Joanne's murder in the days after the crime. Colin Allen, who was the trainer, wrestled with the knowledge before telling Dyson's mother, who eventually told police of his admission. Dyson fancied himself as a ladies man, or in England as they call it, a jack the lad. He would use his position on nightclub doors to chat up women who came into the venues. He is remembered by colleagues as mouthy and loud and would spend much of his time talking about his athletic prowess and his physique. Dyson's actions after Joanne's murder clearly demonstrated his arrogance. Closed circuit TV footage filmed at the store across the road from their home in Hotham Road showed him calmly buying bin bags and rubber gloves at around the time of Joanne's death. He wrapped her body in the sacks and then carried it to the car. This was during broad daylight, before driving it to the countryside and dumping her body. The next day, he went to work and behaved as though nothing untoward had happened. Now, Dyson had several key relationships before meeting Joanne. In 1993, he met Kerry Thompson while they were both attending Bishop Burton Agricultural College. Kerry Thompson told police how during arguments he would pace up and down, hitting walls and grabbing her to stop her leaving. In June 1999, Dyson met his ex-wife, Jenny Marie Clark, and proposed after two weeks. He fathered a daughter, Chloe, who was born in October 2000. The couple's stormy relationship was marred with blazing public rows. The two separated in 2002 and filed for divorce later that year. Shortly afterwards, Dyson met Joanne. Now, Joanne was described as a bubbly person, a bright person, a, a person who loved her family. Joanne Nelson was her family's darling, the most popular girl in her circle of friends and a woman with everything to live for. She longed for a family of her own someday and thought she had found the man to share it in Paul Dyson, the bodybuilder and big shot who had charmed her on a night out in Hull. But the man whom she hoped would protect and care for her snuffed out her life in a moment of violence on her kitchen floor. The wounds inflicted on Joanne Nelson's family that day will never heal. They are mourning the slaying of a girl without malice who touched every heart she met. During her funeral, over 200 people turned up. A moving tribute was given by one of Miss Nelson's younger sisters, Katie, which brought many of the mourners to tears. She said anyone who knew Joanne knew she was a wonderful person. She goes on to say she was fun-loving, high on life and bubbly. She was always the good one. So it's hard to understand why something like this has happened to her. Now, Joanne was a talented sportswoman when she was in school. She was great at netball and at rounders. For those that know, rounders is the British equivalent of baseball. At the time of her death, she was working at the local job centre, where she is fondly remembered. Colleagues said that she would go out of her way to do things for people and they said that photographs that were published after her death would not do justice to how beautiful she really was. The man who murdered Joanne when she chastised him for failing to help around the house bound her body with refuse sacks, carried her to the car and drove her to the remote woodland spot before he returned to their home and began his elaborate cover-up getting rid of her work clothes leaving messages on her phone. When he left for work on the day of her disappearance, it was reported he staged a mock conversation with her on his mobile phone for the benefit of a friend. Then he cynically turned to Joanne's parents for support, weeping on their mother's shoulder and telling her how he longed for her safe return. Now on November the 8th, 2005, Paul was sentenced to life imprisonment to serve a minimum of 18 years. Now I'll go back to the lack of confidence. See, Paul, deep down, was insecure. He needed the approval of other people, particularly Joanne. And when Joanne would not give him the approval he was looking for, the validation he was looking for, he would lash out. His family has a history of odd moments, let's put it. And whenever I look back at one's family and upbringing, I always look at it with a pinch of salt. Because if you were to look at my life, with a microscope, if you were to look at my upbringing, my friendships, my relationships, right? I'm sure you would find holes everywhere you look. But from his arrogance to thinking he was God's gift to women, I mean, just consider this situation, right? You're with your partner. This is what I'm like. You're with your partner, right? You have a disagreement in public, let's say. You go out for dinner, you go out for lunch, whatever it may be. You have a disagreement. In that moment, I normally just stay quiet or I change the subject 
because public perception is everything right i don't like having rows in public and the reason why i don't is because i am strong enough in that moment to walk away and then approach the situation again later on but paul on the other hand he could not let go when paul was annoyed when paul got pissed off he had to have it resolved in that moment he needed clarity in his mind in that moment my guess and all of this is my guess purely my own inferences my guess would be that he needed security from joanne or whoever his partner was in that moment to make him feel better and given the size of his ego when joanne essentially said you're useless mate you can't even turn on the dishwasher you don't even know how to do the washing machine and other things that she said to him, his arrogance, his ego, his self-worth was so damaged. He thought of himself so highly that mere criticism is the reason why he murdered her. Now, this did take place over 15 years ago. So I hope the family probably haven't gotten over it, but I'm sure they've gotten used to it. May Joanne rest in peace. And the thing about British law, it's quite lenient in comparison to American law. In America, this guy would never see the light of day ever again. But in England, 18 years, there's a chance he could be released. I don't think this man should ever be released. Why don't you guys comment? Tell me what you think.